All right, we are live. Welcome, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good night tonight. Um, my name is Lieutenant Bob Roberts with Civil Air Patrol. I am one of the aerospace education officers here in South Carolina, out of Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, we have a special guest with us tonight. And let me bring him on. We've got, uh, see, let me get your microphone going. We have Carrie McCauley. Hi, Carrie. How are you? Hey. Awesome. Hey, I'm doing really good, Bob. Awesome. Well, Carrie, first of all, thanks uh, so much for uh, for joining us. Um, I know everybody was really excited to have you coming on board. And um, we had a couple of questions to ask you um, that some of the cadets, some of our senior members have sent me uh, some questions. I, I got to tell you, I've actually been living vicariously through you for the last uh, the last week. Um, I think I've watched all of your shows. I think that I, I read your entire book. Um, and, and I got to say, you're insane. So I just want to start off by saying that. <laughs> um, so I have to live. Canada, by, I argue that. <laughs> I have to live vicariously through you because if I didn't, I would never do any of this stuff in my life. So, so a couple. Th so for the people that don't know you, um, you know, I'll give you a, a brief introduction, um, and then I'm going to kind of hand it over to you so that I don't do all the talking. Um, so really, you you started your kind of your career, your craziness career, I want to say, like you were young. So you started the, you joined the army at age 17, correct? That's correct. Now, when you joined at 17, though, you were still a junior. So how did, how did that work? Yeah, well, my friend and I um, joined the Minnesota National Guard, like I said, when we were 17, and we went to uh, basic training in between our junior and senior year of high school. So Got to spend the summer shooting machine guns and throwing hand grenades and then back to school to finish high school. Okay. So everybody else is like on Daytona beach, like in the sand and, and you're, you're throwing hand grenades. <laughs> so that's a little, <laughs> <Why not? laughs> that sounds like fun to me. So, um, how about your parents? Your parents had to sign off on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. My mom wasn't, uh, she wasn't a big fan of me joining the army at that young age. My dad would, didn't take any convincing, but uh, I had to work with my mom a little bit, but in the end, she acquiesced. <laughs> well, she thought that was scary. I can only imagine. So, now, let me ask you this question. Did, did, did she, uh, have you told your mother all the crazy things you do or, or is she kind of still in the dark? No, no. I, I, I leak them out in little bits and drabs here, <laughs> here and there. But, uh, I think when she finally actually read the book, she was a little, uh, a little less happy with me, but <laughs> too late. Yeah, there might've been a book. I might not want to share to my, with my mom. Maybe I, maybe, maybe I would have given her like a, a, a second book, you know, like Dr. Seuss or something and be like, look at, <laughs> I'm a poet. Um, now, now you, now one thing I read is that you have the nickname scary Carrie. So, so how, where do you get, how did you get that nickname? Uh, I got that in high school and basically just of all the crazy stuff I used to do. I mean, I was a pole vaulter. Um, we explored caves, you know, a spelunker, skied in, in the trees, dangerous runs, every, you know, pretty much if it was dangerous and weird and scary, that's what I would do. So it kind of, it kind of stuck. Cool. Cool. Now it's not aerospace related, but you actually, um, one of the things you mentioned, one of the things you mentioned, but it, it's kind of related to aerospace, but that's your sense of adventure. And so that's really that, that mindset. Um, you know, and, and one of the things I was kind of thinking of before we started, um, I was kind of setting up all the hardware was, you know, it's interesting in aviation. We, we see, we come off as very risk adverse, you know, don't take risks, don't take risks, don't take risk. Those of you that uh, want to get a job in uh, the airlines, assuming that, you know, jobs and airlines come up again. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, usually they'll, they'll try to figure out how risk adverse you are because um, they don't want people taking risks. But yet, if you look at the people that are like super, like, you know, they've done a ton of stuff in aviation, it, these people aren't risk adverse. Like you've done a ton of stuff in aviation. You're not risk adverse. You know, Charles Lindbergh, a ton of stuff in aviation. He wasn't risk averse. <laughs> um, yeah. People that, you know, the, the astronauts on the Mercury. So people weren't risk averse. So, um, so, so what do you, what do you think it is? So where do you think that line is between, you know, risk management and trying to, to push it? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, I think the more a pilot has pushed it in the past to, to a degree, 
and the more situations he's gotten himself or herself into and then out of, the better pilot they're going to be. I mean, you don't want your first emergency situation to be in a Airbus with 300 passengers relying on you. You want to have, you want to have had, had you know, you build up your emergencies, you know, little ones at first, you know, and then kind of push a little bit, have something happen, figure it out. Um, and I think that starts even before you start flying. And I think a lot of pilots are like that. You know, most pilot, you know, people who decide to become pilots haven't lived their whole life in a bubble up to that point. And then all of a sudden, I want to be a pilot. You right. know, they've they've done some stuff. Yeah, kind of, you know, I was kind of thinking earlier when um, I was reading your book, I was kind of thinking of the whole Star Trek Captain Kirk, you know, and, uh, you know, and Leonard Nimoy, right? You know, uh, you know, you know, they, they want Kirk, you know, to be kind of a little bit out there. Right. And, and the risk adverse people try to pull them back a little bit, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but sometimes it's good to have the captain that's ready to take that step forward. Um, now, a lot of people that um, spelunking, you mentioned that earlier, and uh, I know what it is because I read your book um, and then I did a bunch of Google searching. <laughs> I found a bunch of really <laughs> cool stuff. But a lot of the folks that are probably listening is probably don't know what spelunking is. Can you, can you what is it? How did you get in, involved in it? Uh, spelunking is essentially cave exploring. And not not the cave exploring where you go on a tour and somebody holds your hand and and there's electric lights. This is actually going down into into caves deep underground and squirming your way into really tiny holes. Uh, we started it in. I grew up, you know, close to St. Paul, Minnesota, and the Ford factory dug these sand sand caves out of the out of the river bluffs to use the sand for. Um, windshields mm -hmm. and after we my friends and I had done that for a little bit we decided to try the real thing and we got a hold of some guys at the University of Minnesota and they took us out real spelunking and let me tell you the the first time you see a guy worm his way into a hole about the size of a football oh wow that that kind of <laughs> that's 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 the real deal that's crazy yeah but, uh, now, I love it now you don't, you know, there's no extra oxygen. So you, you get, you get stuck. You're, you're toast, right? I mean, <laughs> that seems oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I had a friend of mine get, get really stuck and we were, he had a, a rock dislodge and come down on his back cause he was squeezing into a hole and we didn't think he was going to get out of there. We were way, way back there and it was, there was no rescue possible there, but he managed to uh, worm his way out after about half an hour or so. Now, yeah, it's, one of my guys is asking on the side here. He says, you know, have you ever gotten stuck in a cave before? You know, and how did it happen? How long was it? I never got stuck. Um, I've gotten to a couple points where I couldn't move for <laughs> a few minutes. I guess you could call that stuck. Um, probably the, the worst thing that happened to me is I had a, a mini panic attack. I think it was induced by lack of oxygen. I was yeah. number six in a line of a guy's going through a really small tunnel. And this is back when we used to use carbide lights, which is basically water dripped into some rocks that emitted natural gas. And we had so basically candles on our heads. And the hole was about the size of like climbing under a, uh, an office chair. And after a while, I just really wanted to stand up. And <laughs> had to stop calm myself down and continue on because nothing else you can do there yeah yeah i bet uh you know having people around you too is probably a little helpful you know that there's someone's going to try to help you but in the end you're stuck you're stuck <laughs> so i know um for the for, yeah. for the folks that do know me uh most of them know that that uh, i'm a volunteer firefighter and um so one of the, you know they, they train you how to like try to calm yourself um which is really easy to do when you're in training uh, one time I had a roof collapse on top of me and I actually did get stuck. Um, and all of a sudden, all that, you know, stay calm thing. If you're not like you said before, you know, you have to kind of get used to how to deal with an emergency. Um, you don't want that to be your first day when you're in the Airbus. And, um, you know, I know when I in the fire department, uh, when it actually happened for the first time and you only have so much air um, and you're going, man, I hope these people get here in time. Um, yeah, it definitely is a different thought. Uh, so Joshua, thanks for that question. Um, now, um, you know, one of the other things I thought, so in your book, you talk about having a daydream logbook, right? You talk about, you know, your hundred thousand hours, I think it was, you mentioned in your daydream logbook. So in your, so if you, if we pull down, we're going to get to your real life stuff in a second, but in your daydream logbook, 
What's the best flight you've ever logged in there? So what's what's your what's your dream? <laughs> what do you want to do? Oh boy, I guess the the early years was probably dog fighting the Germans during World War II. You know, I was a big World War II buff, and you know, built all kinds of models. My uh, my bedroom had a huge dog fight hanging from the ceiling, and you know, so that was that was what I always envisioned. You know doing that dog fighting fighter mm-hmm. pilot um also you know when i started getting a little older i started looking you know reading about flying all over the world just having adventures you know i was a very adventurous person i like to go out and do stuff so you know flying around the world was definitely one of my uh one of my goals as i was growing up in my daydream logbook cool cool now i'm going to ask you um kind of your army stuff in a second but so just on that point have you ever um since you want to do that, have you ever thought about like, uh, cause you, you, you have so many hours coming overseas and going through Canada, um, near Markham, Ontario. Um, there is a group, a group out there called air Canada. Um, and they own a bunch of world war two fighter aircraft. Um, and so if, if you have so much flight hours that, uh, you'd probably be able to get into one of those things. They're, they're still obviously going to have somebody in there with you. They're not going to trust you in there by themselves. But, um, <laughs> But you get a chance to go, um, you know, go fighter piloting, you know, at least in, uh, you know, in, in, in theory, anyways, if you've ever thought about that. Oh, yeah, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Let me know. Mark, I'll Mark dog Ontario. You. I'll dog fight right. you. Okay, cool. <laughs> I don't fit. I'm six foot seven, so I ain't fitting. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> so now, now, you, now, going back a little bit, so, so you joined um, the Army and you were a crew chief. Um, and so for the folks that don't know what a crew chief does and you were in a, you were in a UE, right? In the UEs. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so what does a, what did you do as a crew chief in the army? A crew chief is basically the guy that's in charge of the helicopter, um, in charge of all the maintenance, you know, scheduling the maintenance, do a lot of maintenance myself, you know, be, be a crew chief. You have to be a army certified mechanic, but basically your day is, you know, take the plane out of the hangar, pre-flight it, make sure it's all ready to go. Um, fire guard when their pilots are starting it up. And then in flight, you know, your, your man of the door guns, we had uh, 60, uh, M60 machine guns on either side. Oh. If we use rescue hoist, you're the one in charge of the hoist. Uh, you're also, if you do sling loads where a helicopter will pick up things that are attached to, you know, straps and stuff, you'll, you're the one that either sets that up or guides the pilot onto the sling load. So you're pretty much the one in charge of the helicopter yeah. and you just tell the pilots where to go and they do all that easy stuff like flying. Yeah. In the end, you know, we just have, in the end, the pilot's job is just to get you, get the right person to the right place and not run into the, into a wall or the water. Right. So, so you really, you're the one in charge. Right. So that, that's pretty sweet. Um, so now what, how did you get from crew chief where you weren't flying the helicopter um, how did you get from that into aviation? What was the mindset? Well, I'd always known I wanted to be a pilot. And right after high school, I you know, started going to college and at the same time taking flying lessons. And right about then, one of my friends in my Army aviation unit, had, you know, I hadn't seen him for a couple of months. I said, hey, where you been? He said, well, I just got back from Africa. I was like, Africa? What the heck? He said, yeah. I was ferrying an airplane out to Africa. And I, that's the first time I'd heard about ferry pilots. And he told me about, you know, flying a, pl- a small plane from Minnesota to South Africa. And I said, I want to do that. That sounds like the coolest job in the world. Now, at that time, I didn't actually have a pilot's license. So I just uh, kind of redoubled my efforts and started taking classes, you know, lessons as quickly as I could, got all my ratings and worked toward that goal. Now, to be a ferry pilot, one thing I didn't understand when I was reading the book a little bit, um, to be a ferry pilot, do you have to have your ATP? Do you have to have those 1,500 hours? No, no. Okay. Um, you know, when I talked to my, you know, talked to my buddy, he said, at the time, you needed about 1,500 hours just to be considered for a job. You know, okay. the, the air aviation industry goes in high cycles. It seemed like every time everybody's hiring with hardly any time at all. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of t- hours, but I didn't want a job. And then when I really wanted a job, they wanted 2,000 hours or something. But, yeah, I, I got uh, my first job as a ferry pilot with just under 1,500 hours. Cool. Uh, going back to the crew chief thing, one of the we got a, a question from uh, Burke Hansen. And Burke asked the question, he goes, 
what was the most, what was your most difficult project or maybe mission, uh, as a crew chief? Um, well, we had a, a C5, uh, galaxy come in one time and I was in charge of trying to get, uh, as many Hueys as we could inside the, the C5, which was kind of a challenge. Um, we did a lot of air assaults, probably one of the, one of the most difficult things we did is we had a sling load one time with a Jeep slung beneath the Huey and it, um, it started oscillating pretty bad. It was swinging back and forth oh, wow. and I was having to tell the pilot, you know, it would swing one way. Like, okay. It's up to our uh, eight o'clock position. And now it's peaked out. Now it's coming back. And, and it was pulling the helicopter back and forth quite a bit. And we almost had to punch it out, but I was, I oh, worked wow. with the pilots and kind of, kind of got it dampened out a bit. So that was, that was difficult. Yeah. It, all of a sudden it starts making you really think about that center of gravity. <laughs> you read in a book, it's one thing when you start seeing yourself swinging from side to side, it puts it into your place. Um, let's see, this may have been the same thing. Uh, Andrew, uh, asked the question. He said, what was the most intense emergency you've been in? Was it, was that probably about it in helicopters? Uh, he yeah, actually was- helicopter. Okay. Yeah. So we know we'll ask that question again, Andrew, when we get into more of the, the, the ferry flying, um, let's see here. And, and before we move on, uh, there's somebody whose name is a random name. Uh, so you wanted to know, uh, so going back to your, uh, your, your, your dream log book, what's, uh, what's your favorite plane of world war II? You know, I always liked the, uh, the Thunderbolt, you know, the P 47, you know, that was just the, the jug. It's just such a big meaty plane. I just, I just love that plane. I mean, I love the Corsair and everybody loves the Mustang and the P 38, but I, I like the Thunderbolt. Yeah, Thunderbolt just it just wants to take over the air. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so all right, cool. So now, after you got your pilot's license, um, you started training to skydive. So, what uh, what made you desire to do that? Well, um, I for the National Guard, I went to air assault school, and that's learning how to repel out of helicopters. This was way back in the in the mid '80s before fast roping. We actually repelled out of helicopters, kind of like mountain climbing repelling. Mm-hmm. And that was a long, uh, long and very tough course. And the actual repelling out of the helicopters was pretty scary, pretty nerve wracking, but it just whetted my appetite for more. I mean, it's like, that was pretty cool hanging on the outside of an aircraft. Yeah. How else can I do that? Mm-hmm. Well, skydiving. And my, my friend knew, saw, knew a place that did it. And we drove out to this little farm field in the middle of Wisconsin and started skydiving and changed my life. Wow. So, all right. So what, what, what is it like that for like, like two things, first of all, were, were you the kid that just like scared your mom, like on a daily basis, just like climbing onto roofs, <laughs> the biggest trees you could find? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. All right. So, so any time, any, any time, hopefully uh, in your life, you got a chance to hug your mother and say, you're sorry, you probably should do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so what, okay. So uh, what is it like the first time? So, so very few people have skydived. Now, now that's actually your, your kind of your main thing now, right? Is that you teach skydiving? Is that, is that still kind of what you're mainly doing or? Yep. Yep. Uh, I own a skydiving school close to Minneapolis and, uh, that's what I do six, seven months a year. I, this, this year I did, you know, we had two months of shutdown for the COVID, but sure. I still ended up doing about 600 jumps this summer and, uh, wow. I do it a lot. Wow. Yeah. So, all right. So I, I, I got to tell you, so I've thought about for years and years and years and years learning how to skydive. So what, what, what is it like? So maybe I'll come, maybe I'll come visit you. You can, you, you can come teach me how to, you can teach me how you to bet. skydive. Um, so what's it like the first time that you let go of that airplane? You know, it's a complete, completely different world. And we get asked this question all the time and it's literally impossible to explain it because it feels like skydiving. Um, free fall doesn't feel like falling, you know, that stomach mm-hmm. in your throat, uh, you know, off a high dive kind of a thing. It just, it feels like nothing. Really? The, the environment is so different. It's a completely alien environment for you. I mean, just, and you will remember your first jump, like, for the rest of your life. I remember my first day and the, the whole day and the first jump, like it was yesterday. And that was 34 years ago, just burned into my soul. All right. So now, unfortunately I should have st- stopped what I'm saying because we have one of our wing commanders watching tonight uh, and an AFF instructor. 
and, he, and he's basically threatening to push me out of the airplane. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's very nice. But um, all right. So, you know, so those people that want to do it, right? Um, well, here's a question I have that's probably only valid for me. Um, so one of the reasons I haven't done it so far, other than being chicken, is is that I'm six foot seven, two hundred and sixty pounds. I heard someplace you got to be two twenty or less. Is is there a, is there a weight thing? It depends on the uh, on the skydiving school. Okay. Um, our gear used to be a weight limit of two twenty five. Okay. But we, now we have new gear, and I think we can get up to like two seventy five, something like oh, okay. that. So, yeah, so, not a problem. The, the newer gear, it's it's what it's rated for, basically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're telling me they're not going to push me. They're just going to encourage. <laughs> so, um, We're not allowed to push you, but it's really noisy up there and no sounds just like go. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, all right. So, so, you know, the other thing too, is so, so there's probably, there's probably nothing like this. So one of the things I saw is um, I just got back from Disney today and we were, we actually drove for the eight hours from Orlando to, uh, to Greenville today. And we, one of the places we passed, you could see they had like one of those indoor skydiving. And that's just really a big fan, right? It, it probably, uh-huh. it, maybe, you, maybe it could help you a little bit, right? But it's probably nothing at all, you know, like real skydiving. Oh, no. It's, it's, it's very similar. Really? Um, we, yeah, my, my daughter's actually a wind tunnel instructor, and I've been the wind tunnel a bunch of times. Skydivers right now will go into the wind tunnel to train for competitions and do other things. And if we have a student that's having a particularly hard time in free fall, like mm-hmm. what we do is we, we let you go and see how you do. And if you're really not getting it, mm-hmm. you know, we'll say, you know, go – Go to a wind tunnel, spend 10 minutes in there, and they'll get you dialed in because it's so much easier when your life isn't on the line. You know, when, <laughs> yeah, you're freaking out. When you're on your back spinning around like crazy, and I've got to catch you and flip you over and pull your parachute for you, yeah. there's not a lot of learning going on. But when you get to a wind <laughs> tunnel, they can actually, the instructor's just going to stand on the net and hold you and push your feet and the arms to the right position and say, there, do that. Yeah. And uh, so I know it's a great training tool. Wind tunnels are great. All right. So that's good to know. I, I got a question here. Um, one person said, how do you compensate for a person who would weigh more than 275? Uh, to that, I would say being a guy who's six foot seven and there's not many people taller than me. Unfortunately, it's probably going on a diet, right? I mean, at some point physics takes over and <laughs> you, you either weigh that or you don't, right? Well, we've actually taught, I think the heaviest student we ever had was 320 oh, wow. and what we did is we modified a tandem rig a tandem rig tandem rig is basically a parachute that's designed for carrying two people and it has a it has a 500 pound weight limit mm-hmm. and so we just modified it so he could use it himself and taught him to skydive he's still jumping with us today wow been jumping for about 15 years yeah that is awesome all right that's good to know um so, you know, it's funny is I didn't, I expected, so I expected to get tons of questions when we got to the flying portion of this. Um, but I am getting so many questions about the skydiving. <laughs> um, so let me do this. So, um, yeah, so, you know, uh, so to our chat groups here, we will, um, I'm going to come back to the questions of the skydiving, uh, you know, assuming that uh, Carrie has enough time at the, at the end. But Carrie, a quick question for you on that. So if, if folks wanted to uh, skydive with you, right? Um, you know, what is, cause we have so many people talking about skydiving now. So do, is there, okay, first of all, let, let's say they can't come out to you. Right. And so okay. they look up a local school. It, I have lots of opinions on how to find a good CFI, you know, things of that. Um, but I have no idea when it comes to skydiving. So if somebody was going to look for a place to skydive, what, what's, what would be a recommendation from you of what to look for? Well, first thing is you want to make sure they're a member of the United States Parachute Association, USPA. And 95, 99% of drop zones in the country are. And the USPA does a great job of training their instructors all to the same standard. Now, just like CFI, some are better than others. Some are better teachers than others. Some are better in the air. Um, there's really no way to, to tell that except by maybe, you know, look going online and, you know, even online looking at comments and reviews are kind of tough because right. um, most of those are just, we had a great time sort of, sort of things. But I would say you're, you're pretty safe at going at going to just about any 
USPA rated drop zone and going skydiving. All right, cool. A bigger drop zone probably has more more and better staff, but some of the small drop zones have some guys that have been doing it for 40 years and 25,000 skydives and are fantastic. So, Yeah, you know, I think that's also something that's really important, you know, for uh, folks that are watching this to understand too. A lot of people will see, we're going to talk in a, in a little bit about how crazy you are. Um, but, uh, but the, the skydiving may be the most non-crazy thing you've done. I mean, um, you know, you, you've, uh, I mean, how many, just for the group to know how many skydive, I think people are going to be surprised to hear this. How many skydives would you estimate you've done? I've done over 20,000. 20,000. That's pretty I mean, accurate. We keep a lot of Yeah. You've never bounced off the ground at an accelerated speed yet. Right. <laughs> so. I skipped off the ground once. Get, uh, <laughs> I didn't get it. But you, you, it's like flying, right? You, you, any landing you can walk away from. So, so, true, true. Um, so, okay, cool. So, so, I mean, in the end, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a, it seems like a pretty safe, you know, as long as you come at it with a plan and, you know, a skill set involved, uh, it seems like it's pretty safe. Um, you, there's a backup parachute in case the main parachute doesn't go, um, things of that nature, right? Yep. Yep. Skydiving is pretty safe. I mean, we never tell anybody it's safe, but nothing is <laughs> nothing safe, safe yeah. but, but it's, it's really safe. I mean, statistically your odds of getting hurt are way less than playing softball or driving in your car or definitely flying. It's, it's way safer than flying in my opinion, which is really hard to convince pilots of because you know, <laughs> right. pilots, pilots are the worst people to try to talk into skydiving because they just think you're, that's madness. Jump out of perfect good air, <laughs> that's right. perfectly good airplane. Like, well, <laughs> I've done it 20,000 times. I have 9,000 hours. I kind of do both a lot yeah. and I'm here to tell you skydiving is safer. Yeah. You know, the reason actually, um, again, to be selfish with the conversation, the, the reason that I actually want to try to learn how to skydive is my, my dream airplane is a biplane. And, um, and I've always thought to myself, if I, if I bought a uh, biplane, I would want to make sure I could, I would be comfortable in an emergency jumping out of it. <laughs> um, not yeah. take it to the ground. Um, cause I'm more afraid of jumping out than I am, you know, of, uh, the landing. So, you know, I I've said that for years, anybody that flies with a parachute on their back, like for aerobatic purposes or something should make a couple of skydives for exactly the reason you mentioned. You don't want to hesitate because you're scared of the parachute. You know, mm -hmm. a skydiver, the second something goes wrong with that parachute or with the plane, he's out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Engine coughs once, where'd Bob go? We, we, we fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> nope, he's like, see you. I'm out of here. <laughs> going down. Um, so, all right. So now, now your wife is Kathy, right? Correct. So now she started, now did she, how did, now she's also skydiving as well, right? No. No, she's not skydiving. She's not skydiving. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I thought I read that she had started skydiving. So she started nope. started flying? No. You're, I think you're thinking of my daughter, Claire. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. All right. So is Claire yeah. no, Kathy skydiving? Doesn't fly. Yep. Claire's the one. She's a wind tunnel instructor um, and, co and competitor. She also shoots uh, free fall video for us. Her and her boyfriend were up here this summer from California working with me all summer and my son too. He's also, he's a, he's a black Hawk medevac crew chief in the guard. Oh, wow. Cool. Just in my old unit, actually in some of the, some of the same people that were in when I was in, were still in when he joined, which is pretty cool. And he's also an instructor. He's got uh, almost 3000 jumps. Claire's coming up on 500. Um, they're both fantastic wow. skydivers. So they do it a lot. Very cool. Very cool. Now, now does she, uh, is she near you? So she, or does she just come out doing the summers to help sometimes or? No, she lives in uh, San Diego now. She, she's working at a wind tunnel okay. in Oceanside and her, she came up and uh, lived at this, the skydiving school this summer because California was pretty shut down and Wisconsin was more open. So we were open quicker. So that was a lot of fun. I mean, being in the plane with both my kids and working with them all summer was was fantastic. I just I just love working with those guys. Now, now, so you've got the nickname Scary Carrie. Now, has she done anything uh, to, to give her the nickname Scary Claire? No, no, she's. Uh, I don't know if she really has much in the way of nicknames, but um, <laughs> she, she's a she's a fantastic free fly freestyle 
skydiver. That's just basically aerial ballet or gymnastics. But if you know, if you're ever curious, go to Google wind tunnel competition mm-hmm. and watch what they can do in that wind tunnel. It will blow your mind. And she's gone to nationals three times. She took uh, silver this year's uh, freestyle competition in skydiving. So mm-hmm. she can do literally anything in the air and make it look effortless. That's awesome. Me, not so much. Not so much. <laughs> it's grace is in the eye of the beholder. So yeah. Now, um, now, uh, before we move on from, because I have so many people that are asking such great questions. So um, now, going continuing on with that conversation, is how do I say this right way? I'm trying to think of the right way to ask the question. Um, so when she, okay, let me, let me ask a different way. So the 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 flying part of the skydiving, right? So um, a lot of folks, you know, they they're if they want to become an airline pilot, right? So about half of our cadets in CAP, you know, are interested in becoming pilots, you know, you know, for a career, whether it's military or, or aviation long-term. Um, so they have to have a number of hours. And so one of the things I've seen a lot of folks talk about is jobs that you can get before your 1500 hours, um, you know, try to build up the hours. Obviously CFI is, you know, one of the major things that people do. But I have read that um, one, uh, the ferry pilot we're going to talk about in a second, but also the um, people that fly skydivers, that that's actually a good job for people that have that, you know, 500 to 1,000 hour mark um, to get some additional hours. Would you agree with that? Or is that not enough hours for, you know, people that are flying the skydivers? No, totally. It's uh, one of the best ways to build hours and experience. Um, Skydive pilots, the hours you get in skydiving are worth 10 times normal hours, in my opinion, because you're doing so much more in those hours. There's mm-hmm. no straight and level. Your max gross takeoff with reduced fuel, climbed, climbed altitude, you're, you've got to arrive over the correct spot as efficiently and on time as possible and as precise as possible. Open the door, have a bunch of people climb outside the plane. So now you've got to control a plane that's got asymmetrical load on one side and then they jump out and the plane shifts and you got to close the door roll it over and dive at the ground as fast as you can while not wrecking oh, wow. anything or and do do a quick landing and turn around and do it again and do that all day wow. um, your stick and rudder skills become so much better than your average pilots and you're just exposed to so many more things in the air many Lots of mini emergencies, some major emergencies. Mm-hmm. Most jump planes are not as well equipped as a lot of planes. Um, they're all they're all usually pretty well maintained, but they don't look like flight school planes. So FAA mandate of these at least half a roll of duct tape on any jump plane. So <laughs> um, no, you'll you'll your skills will become will really really improve flying jumpers. Unfortunately, your attitude toward normal flying will definitely change and you'll have a hard time maybe fitting into the corporate airline structure after spending a thought, you know, five, six hundred hours flying in shirts and a T-shirt and flip flops. So, yeah, take yeah. what you can. Yeah. And I, I mean, after hearing what you just said, I, I can't even imagine just going into an airplane and hitting autopilot and sitting there for four hours. Um, I mean, that's. Yeah. yeah, I've never even thought about, you know, just the dynamics of what you just said, you know, of the flight profiles. And um, that's really awesome. Um, I, I may I may look to see if I can get a summer job, see if my wife will let me do a summer job someday. Because um, that, that sounds like You'll a lot of it. fun. Flying jumpers is a blast. That sounds like it a really lot of is. fun. Um, all right. So going more into the ferry, otherwise we're going to run out of time. So going into the ferry, ferry piloting. So um, you got approached uh, just because so, a lot of people may not know your name, um, you know, if they haven't seen you on TV. And so um, a lot of folks are probably going to be surprised. Wait, Bob's got somebody who was on TV. Yes, we have somebody who's on TV. <laughs> um, so you were on Discovery Channel's um, uh, – oh, shoot, brain freeze. Um, what was Dangerous it? Flights. Dangerous Flights. Thank you. I was trying to remember the name Dangerous. I had a worse name than that in my head for some reason. I couldn't get rid of <laughs> Um, like crazy people, pilots or something like that. So, so dangerous flights. How did you get involved in that? How did they find you? Actually, I kind of found them. I was on a, I bought a beach queen air, which is a piston version of a King air and got on beach talk, which is Beechcraft owners forum basically. 
and the discovery channel had put out a, a call for ferry pilots, huh. you know, Hey, are you interested in being on a TV show? It was like fun. So I answered the, answered the email and they contacted me. And, um, at first I kind of thought I'd screwed up the Skype interview. Cause you know, I was trying to be all stiff and proper and I should have been just my normal self. And then I, about a month later, they called me and say, can you fly a plane to Argentina tomorrow? And oh, boom, wow. I was on TV. So, wow. Now, yeah. now, normally, um, so, so, so not, so that's pretty awesome. Um, so let's talk about the ferry flying. So for the folks that don't know, what, what does a ferry pilot do? A ferry pilot is somebody who, if somebody has a plane that they need flown on the other, to the other side of the planet and they're not stupid enough to fly it over the ocean themselves, <laughs> I'm the guy they call. Okay. <laughs> basically, basically, you know, if, some, if you buy if, if a person in Singapore buys a plane that's in Ohio, they're not going to want to do it. And insurance companies probably not going to let them fly it over the North Atlantic themselves. You know, they're going to, they're going to need somebody who's done it before. So a professional that will probably get it there without putting it in a drink. So now that's some, what I fear. Now, some people, they don't know. Um, I've actually done this once myself because um, I had a long flight, but um, so explain to people how you get more gas in an airplane than what fits in the wing. Well, we use ferry tanks. Basically, we will take the seats out, all but the pilot seat, and put them in the back and then install. You, most of the time, I like to use metal ferry tanks, but sometimes you can use rubber ferry tanks and okay, put, only used the, put those in the plane, the yeah. plumb it into the fuel system. Yeah, plumb it into the fuel system and uh, really increases the range, you know. Yeah, I think. Um, a little or more. I think, yeah, I think, I think when I did it, I think I got up like 1,800 miles um between the two ferry tanks uh we had two we had two bladders in there both of them held 80 gallons a piece um so now when you started ferry piloting now i I could just see what people think you know they think to themselves um okay i'm gonna take off i'm gonna hit autopilot i'm gonna take a nap for seven hours and i'm gonna wake up and the gps (laughs) on the autopilot's gonna magically put me exactly where i need to be um you started doing this there was no gps there there was no (laughs) right um so how did like how did you go about like, now you're really talking charles Lindbergh stuff right i mean because you know yeah you've got a, a, an hf radio and i know our cadets are familiar with hf because we use hf a lot in cap um so you have an hf radio i'm assuming attached to the airplane somehow uh most airplanes don't typically have hf but um so you know you may be able to talk to somebody but the you know once you're in the air and you're pointing into a certain direction if you're over the water and that wind's not going the way you think. How do you not like end up in Africa when you were shooting for North America? So, <laughs> well, you hope that the wind's law forecast you got was accurate because there's no other way to no other way to know. I mean, when you're out over the ocean, there's no way to gauge your process or check your math or check your navigation. Um, it was always kind of funny. Every hour or so, you're supposed to make a position report on the HF radio to Gander Control, and you just basically said, "Well, I haven't crashed yet, and that's really all I can tell you. I don't know if I'm on course. I don't know how far I am from anywhere, but you know, I'm still chugging along." Um, no, the winds of forecast we got from Canada was usually really accurate, but we'd sit down with the, the old E6B and do a do a whole flight plan that each lat long position and you know, minor corrections for, you know, for the wind changes. And it was kind of good that the where the area we went to a lot that was really hard to find was uh, the Azores, Santa Maria, the Azores. The Azores are a chain of islands off the coast of Portugal. Mm-hmm. And they had, uh, there's one island there, Lodges, that had an NDB that you could pick up 300 miles out on your ADF. And that basically gave you a 600-mile donut to hit so hopefully you're not off by 600 miles but it's possible guys have missed it and you know if your adf craps out on you yeah. then you're in trouble then you're gonna have to gonna have to make sure or hope your navigation and the winds were correct or you're going swimming right and, and, and so for the, the folks that are watching that don't know ndb is based so it's not like the vors where you know you can you can tell exactly what radial you're on an NDB is basically just a radio station, and you can point to it. Um, you don't know exactly 
you know, which radial you're on. You could be south of it, north of it. You just know it's that way. You just point an arrow yep. to it. Um, so, yeah, so NDB stands for non-directional beacon. Um, so how excited were you? I mean, every time you were flying for those many hours and you first got that NDB, was there always that like, okay, I got it. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Especially that first time, you know, by myself, my first trip was completely by myself. My, my boss was in another plane, but he was, you know, 15 minutes ahead of me. So he's, you know, 50, 60 miles ahead of me. I'm by myself. And the first time that needle started twitching just a little bit, I'm like, Oh, Something. <laughs> and we're like, please be the NDB. And uh, when it really got, when I got a good signal, that was a, that was a big relief. Cause I tell you, being a thousand miles out to sea with nothing but uh, a raft and a survival suit is not a comfortable oh, feeling. I can't even imagine. <laughs> so you're, hopefully your HF radio works before you, <laughs> before you start going down, right. you can get people to start coming your way. Um, so now, obviously, you know, we were talking about when you were younger, and obviously you really liked the whole adventure thing. Is that really what made you want to become a ferry pilot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just love adventure, and I love things that are a challenge. And, yeah, I'm kind of a strange person. I, I love emergencies. I love life-or-death emergencies. The worse, the better, as long as I can get out of it, because all the training that I do and all the – experience and knowledge that I have, I love to put it to good use. Mm -hmm. You know, there, I think it was Winston Churchill said, there's nothing more exhilarating than being shot at with no effact. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty much the same. Yeah. It's pretty much the same thing. You know, when, if you have an in-flight emergency, that's the issue is in doubt mm -hmm. and you're like, boy, I've really got to pull this one out. Um, if you successfully get to the ground in one piece that's a great feeling. That is, that is something that's a, that feels really good. And that's, that's kind of what I, what I strive for. It's what I go for. It's like in skydiving, I love it when I have to use my emergency chute, you know, I have mm -hmm. nothing like a great reserve ride to break up a normal boring day of uh, <laughs> skydiving. So, so I, I imagine I don't do it on purpose. That's cheating. Yeah. So, so, so the emergency chute, I'm just curious. So the emergency suit, uh, suit, the emergency chute, um, it, uh, I imagine it's not as big as the primary. So you're, you're probably coming down a little faster. Is that, is that true? Or is it the same size or actually my, my reserve is bigger than my main. Oh, really? Cause, um, you, oh, cause you might open it as like, you last get, minute and it's got to stop you faster. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you start off, they're usually bigger or the same size as your main, but as you get more and more experience, your main parachute gets smaller and smaller mm -hmm. as they get more high performance. If that's your thing. Um, my, my main parachute right now is 79 square feet, which is pretty small. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think my reserve is 143. So, cause you might be unconscious under your reserve. You don't want to be oh. going really fast. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. So yeah, I could even see, so yeah, if you were starting to get high, well, you, hypoxic or, you know, if you were losing oxygen, you guys don't fly that high though, right? You, about 10,000 feet is about the max you guys will go. I would go up to 14. 14. Okay. Oh, yep. But, um, I mean, we'll go higher, but then we have supplemental oxygen yeah. in the plane. You can go even higher and bail out oxygen. But that's, that's too much of a pain. I haven't done that yet, yeah, yeah. but we'll go to 14. It's too, we don't, we don't anticipate being unconscious due to lack of oxygen. It's maybe like a free fall collision. Right. I got you. Cool. So, now, now a lot of people, um, a lot of people say you're, you're flying is really risky, right? So, but, but I also, you know, I read that and I, you know, I, 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 I Googled you a lot, see what people say about you, how crazy you really are and stuff, <laughs> you know, and, and, and different people have different opinions, of course. Right. So, but yeah. I, but I, after reading your book, one of the things that kind of stuck to me and I, and watching the TV show and I, you know, it's, it's a reality TV show, right? So I'm sure there's some things, obviously there's not like when you were doing it for real, there wasn't an airplane sitting next to you videotaping you doing it. No. So, um, so I'm sure a lot of the stuff was recreated and, um, but you know, I, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be sitting there talking to us, right. If you didn't manage the risk. So, you know, it's, so it's not about accepting all the risk. It's about managing the risk that you have. So walk us through, you know, maybe how you would plan, um, you know, an ocean crossing trip. Um, you know, when the only thing, you know, for hundreds of miles is going to be water. 
Okay, well, first of all, you got to look at what route you're going to take. You know, the southern route, if you're going to go down to the Azores, you're definitely going to have to put ferry tanks in it. Um, if you're going to go the northern route, which is Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Europe, um, you can sometimes get away without ferry tanks. It's a little dicey. We've The FAA has made it a lot harder to use ferry tanks these days just because paperwork. They're, they're trying to make things safer, but they've kind of had the opposite effect. Um, when you take the northern route, there's three 670 nautical mile legs you got to cross. And, you know, you're doing that in a normal plane without a ferry tank. It's not a ton of reserve. There's not a ton of uh, excess there. So, um, so when I'm getting ready to go, I'll plan my route, see what I need to do. A lot of it, you know, you talk about the risk and managing the risk. I also, I prepare for, for the worst, you know, I'm looking at what's going to go wrong. And if that happens, what am I really going to wish I had with me? And a lot of that is, you know, survival equipment for the areas I'm going to be crossing. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these trips I might have to prepare for. Lit literally every environment on the planet. You know, you start off by flying over the northern hundreds of miles of northern Canada, so you got to be prepared to, to survive a night or two in northern Canadian wilderness, and it might be cold. Then you got to survive the North Atlantic, so you got to provide ocean survival, survival suit, raft, EPIRB, which is like you know, an e you know, emergency beacon. I don't bring flares along anymore because you can't get them back on the airline. So okay. now I use a laser, a laser pointer for a signal beacon, um, satellite phone. If you can get one emergency radio, you know, stuff you're going to wish you had if you're sitting in a raft in the North Atlantic, then you got to prepare for crossing the Greenland ice cap. So Arctic survival head South. You're going to going to Africa. You got to prepare for desert survival because you're crossing the Sahara and then you're out over the jungle. So literally I have to be ready for anything, for survival that way. Getting the plane ready. Obviously, you know, the ferry tanks do as good a pre-flight as you can. You know, I'll tear apart whatever I can, cut the filter open, make sure the engine's not, used, you know, making any metal. Um, a lot of the stuff in the airplane is going to be just hope it doesn't fail because that's the thing that I have the hardest time with in ferry flying is – the, the maintenance on the airplane because usually a ferry flight a ferry flight is a plane that's been sold and why was a plane sold because the the seller wasn't flying it enough right. that's why you sell a plane i you haven't flown that plane in two years i should sell this thing then it takes another year to sell so a lot of time that plane has been sitting for quite a while till i find it mm -hmm. they usually do a pre-buy inspection maybe an annual usually i'm not uh <laughs> Not too thrilled with the annuals some of these planes get, and then fly it out over the ocean. So, you know, one one little thing in that plane, you know, a main bearing or something goes, and you're going down through no fault of your own. No no amount of planning can prevent those kind of maintenance problems. So, those are some of the things I do. But as far as the danger goes, you know, I I research I research maintenance and airplanes and in-flight emergencies i read everything i can anybody who ever has an airplane emergency i read about it because you never know when that one little nugget of information is going to come in handy someday you're like mm -hmm. you know what i read about this i heard this guy did this this one thing one time so that's kind of that's kind of what i do yeah i put myself out there i i i actively seek out dangerous situations but i don't just blindly go stumbling into them and hope for the best. You know, I'm right. like, I'm prepared as prepared as I can be. Yeah. And so that's, you know, so I'm, I, we're going to talk about your book in a second. So, and then we're going to, I don't want to run out of time, but um, so I do recommend, you know, uh, I've read a lot of aviation books. I even, you know, I've done some videos and other aviation books, you know, and so this is, if, if folks can see it, I'm not sure here. I don't have the printed copy, um, but this is, this is Carrie's uh, book here, Ferry Pilot. Um, Carrie, what's the best way for them to get this book? Do you, I mean, do you prefer if, if, if people want to buy it to get it on Amazon? I, I think I saw that they can buy it directly from your, you know, you have a personal website um, and then maybe you can get rid of some of the Amazon stuff. You know, you get more of the, <laughs> the profit of it or um, yeah, what's yeah. the best way for people to get that book, you think? 
Oh, easiest is Amazon. You can get uh, an ebook or the paperback on Amazon. That's that's pretty simple. Uh, if you want a signed copy, yeah, you can go to my website, which is kerrymccauley.com, and I'll sign one and send you out to if it's you know in the U.S. It usually only takes a couple days, so um, I like that. And you know, I like having signed copies out there. I've got a couple of signed books over in my in my library, and they're pretty kind of special to me, but. Either way works. Yeah, I'll tell you, even though I purchased the one online, you are going to see an order coming in from me because I would love to have one signed by you. Um, okay. So now, are you looking at doing an audiobook version of that sometime in the future? Or? Yeah, I should be. I'm going to start recording that probably in another couple of weeks, as soon as uh, deer hunting season is over. <laughs> okay, okay. You know what? True story. When um, I, we were building our house, the, the the guys framing it they just disappeared for two weeks and I was like where are these where are these people and they were deer hunters <laughs> like it's deer hunting season <laughs> we're out um, so all right I think that was pretty much most of the questions that I've got let me go back to here um, you know somebody uh, a Christian asked a question here uh, you know we talk about the crazy stuff you've done what was the nicest what was the most enjoyable thing you've experienced so far whether it's skydiving or you know your ferry flying or writing your book or, you know, what's the most enjoyable thing you've done? Uh, well, as far as aviation goes, I've had, a, I've had a couple of really fun days. You know, I, I think I mentioned, but mentioned in the book, the afternoon with the Aerostar and Aerostar is the fastest piston twin ever built. And coming up to the Southern tip of Greenland, you know, we landed in our Sasserac. It's an island on the Southern tip to refuel. And the Southern tip of Greenland is one of the most beautiful places in the world to fly. You know, there's just a million icebergs in, you know, and then in the fjords, the mountains are very sharp. And this day I happened to be ahead of schedule, had extra gas, and it was just a gorgeous bluebird day. And I spent probably an hour just banking and cranking around the icebergs in the mountains and up the fjords with that plane. Um, that's one of the, one of the perks you get when you're a ferry pilot, you can, uh, pretty much do what you want when you're out of radar coverage. I don't, <laughs> I don't encourage any of our young pilots to go do stuff like that, but I've had, I've had some really fun, fun, fun times in the airplane doing stuff like that. So well, that that's probably awesome. one of my, but buzzing the pyramids was kind of fun too. I'll have to say. Buzzing the pyramids. I could just see that call from the, F well, there wouldn't be the FAA, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, that'd be pretty fun. Yeah. I mean, most of us, we can only do that stuff in Microsoft flight simulator or X planes. So, so you get to do yep, it in real life. Yep. So that, man, that sounds exciting. Carrie, if folks, um, if they want to learn more about you, if they, you know, we, we talked about your book, um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw a link to that. Um, you know, down in the description of this video, if people wanted to find you, do you have any other social media stuff that you do that you want to point them to or. Yeah. What? Um, my Instagram account is uh fairy pilot book. I think it's fairy pilot dash book. Uh, that's got a lot of great pictures in there for my career as a ferry pilot and skydiver. Um, I'm on Facebook at just Carrie David McCauley or just go Carrie McCauley or search for Carrie McCauley. There's an author page too and my website. But uh, and what was the like name? That. And what was the name of your um, your skydiving business? Oh, Skydive Twin Cities. Skydive Twin Cities. Okay. All right. Yeah. So so if I show up, if you know, six foot seven, two hundred and sixty pound guy, I show up. You're you're gonna you're gonna get me on the ground safely, <laughs> so you bet. All right, well, I'll get you on the ground. That's guaranteed. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. No hundred percent guarantees for getting on the ground safely. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, Carrie, I may take you up on that offer. Uh, maybe that'll be a follow up video. Maybe we can do together. Um, I, I've I've talked about it for just about my entire life, and uh, I, I do want to buy a biplane, and that has actually been one of the things that's held me back. Um, is is knowing I wanted to be able to jump out of that thing if I'm doing some limited aerobatics. And if something goes wrong, I want to be able to get out of the airplane. So um, I may take you up on that offer. So um, sounds great. I don't see any other questions uh, coming online. Just uh, folks saying thank you uh, for your time. So with that, I'm going to say thank you as well. Carrie, anything else you wanted to, to mention before we, uh, we finish up here? Well, just tell your cadets, remember, if you've got time to panic, you've got time to do something more productive. That's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And, and also, uh, if, if, if something goes wrong, it's not, that's not when you want to look at the manual for the first time to see what the emergency procedure is. Yeah, that's so <laughs> you, you want to kind of have that figured out beforehand. Um, 
All right. Well, Carrie, I want to thank you so much for taking uh, you know your time tonight. We really appreciate it, and uh, I know that the, our cadets and our seniors really learned a great deal from it. And I know I learned a great deal from it. And uh, man, I'll, I'll be reaching out to you. I'm going to order one of your books online so I can get uh, your signed copy. And uh, hopefully we'll get. Uh, hopefully you can get my uh, my oversized butt up in an airplane soon. So, <laughs> so. All Hello. right. Thanks, Carrie, so much. We'll talk to you soon. You can have a great day. All right. Thanks, Alan. Bye. Yep. See you. Uh, all right. Let me go here. All right. And with that, uh, I hope everybody had a great time listening to Carrie. And um, we are going to wrap it up here. Um, we are very excited. Um, we have a possible astronaut um, lesson coming up, uh, which would be very super excited. Hopefully, uh, you, you all got a chance to see Crew Mission 1 uh, launch, which went beautiful again. So with that, we are done. Thanks, everybody. I hope you all have a great night, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.